All right, we are interviewing Lisa Mannion and she is running for election as our next King County prosecuting attorney. Um, we are going to um, first have you start off with a two minute introduction. Okay, great. Thank you so much. First, I just want to say thank you to everyone on this call. I know that you do this work in your volunteer time and in your weekend and evening hours, and I'm just very grateful to be here with you. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Lisa Mannion. I'm running for King County Prosecuting Attorney. For the past 15 years, I have served as the Chief of Staff for the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, where I oversee a workforce of nearly 600 employees and an annual budget of $80 million. And in this role, I have implemented effective programs to reduce racial disproportionality, improve public service, and enhance victim services. I'm especially proud of my work as a co-founding partner of Choose 180, which started as a pre-filing juvenile diversion program. I often get asked why I am running, and I'm running because I care about public safety. I care about the work of the office, and I care about its impact on all of our communities in King County. I also care about the women and men who work in the office, who have dedicated their careers to public service and who are looking for experienced and consistent leadership. Um, in order to understand my background, it's really helpful, or in order to understand my why, it's really helpful to understand my background of why I'm a yes and thinker. I was born in South Korea to a Korean mother and a white father. And my dad brought us to his home state of Kentucky when I was an infant. There, my mother met, was met with discrimination and racism, and we lived with my dad's mother, who was white. And one day, when I was about age four, my grandmother and mother got into an argument, and my grandmother threw her out of the house with only the clothes she was wearing, and I didn't see her again for 25 years. My brother and I um, experienced discrimination, and all of the disproportionate school um, discipline and law enforcement contact that, ha that happens to so many young men of color happened to my brother. And I grew up worried about his safety. That said, my grandmother is someone who loved me, who instilled in me a sense of hard work. And it was, she taught me about forgiveness. She wasn't the sum of her worst decision. So when I think about public safety, it's yes and thinking. I care about public safety for all of our neighbors in King County. It means being free of hate crimes that are born out of discrimination. It means offering victim services that are culturally responsive. It means giving nonviolent young people a second opportunity. It means partnering and sharing information with law enforcement. It means both addressing the incidents of crime and root causes of crime. And it means holding repeat perpetrators and violent um, perpetrators accountable. I'm really proud to have been endorsed by King County Executive Dow Constantine, former Governor Gary Locke, uh, Congresswoman Marilyn Strickland, and about 100 others that run the gamut from elected officials, community leaders, former judges, business owners, and victims of crime. If elected, I would be the first woman and the first person of color to hold this seat. And I look forward to answering your questions. Perfect. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm, you answered right on time. So two minutes right there. Um, so we have a we. Uh, did, we got our first prepared question. Um, let's see, Sarah, do you want to take the first prepared? Sure, I'm happy to take our first question. And it's in the chat for your reference. There is growing support in King County for alternatives to incarceration for adults and youth and programs that incorporate restorative justice. And the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office has helped implement a number of alternatives tradition to traditional prosecution and incarceration in recent years. Which of these programs do you support? Are there any you don't support? And what would you do to further invest in programs that work? Well, as I mentioned in my intro, I'm really proud of my work in building innovations and bringing diversion to King County, particularly among young people. So I am supportive of all of the diversion programs. However, I do think that there are some areas that we have not yet addressed. And one of them is around gun violence. So I was successful in getting resources for the prosecuting attorney's office for our crime strategies unit which tracks every gunshot that is fired in King County where someone is killed, injured, or property is damaged. And we know that juvenile gun crime is stabilized and actually it's down just a little bit. 
But I think that we could further reduce juvenile gun crime by doing four key things. One, we have the data. We know the individuals who are at risk of becoming victims of gun violence or perpetrators of gun violence before it happens. I think we have to share that information with our community partners in order to address the, like, the focused areas and also the individuals who are most at risk. Three, I think we have to offer culturally sensitive programming that offers opportunities for um, opportunities and supports that are close to the communities where gun violence happens. And four, for individuals who refuse service or who aren't successful, I think we as community prosecutors and police can work together to offer a court-based intervention that is still holding people accountable, but also continues to offer treatment and services to get to the root cause of crime. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the uh, second question, Sherry, do you wanna take that one? And again, a reminder, these are also in the chat. Okay, okay. Um, question two. A substantial number of felony cases in King County involve mental health and substance issues. What do you consider and how do you prioritize alternatives to incarcerations when mental health and substance abuse plays a role in crime? Well, whenever we have the ability to file directly into our drug courts, our mental health court or our veterans court, I think that is an effective way of bringing both accountability and structured services designed to get to the root cause of crime. Moreover, our therapeutic alternative courts are fully funded by our mental illness drug dependency tax. So they're extremely resourced. And as a result, they are extremely effective at getting people into service. And I have a brief story um, about the effectiveness of these types of alternatives. So we have an individual who over the course of 28 days committed 22 separate thefts of alcohol from the downtown target, thousands of dollars worth of alcohol. Clearly this person has a substance use disorder and was probably selling some of the alcohol to kind of fund his just everyday living expenses. Some time passed before police referred that case to us. Some additional time passed before our office received it and was ready to file it. In the meantime, this individual connected with LEAD, which is now letting everyone advance with dignity. It used to be law, law enforcement assisted diversion. And this individual was starting to see improvement. We still filed the case as a felony directly into drug court. And I have a great working relationship with Lisa Dugart, but she did call on me and ask me why we bothered to file the case when he was doing so well with LEAD. And my answer was that it was accountability designed to hold this person accountable for the 28, the 22 separate thefts that he committed. But moreover, in drug court, there is dedicated housing, dedicated treatment. He still had access to his lead team. Okay, and while he was being successful, we wanted to continue that uprise. So that's accountability and also getting to the root cause. Perfect, thank you. I don't mean to interrupt. I'm, I'll just let you know when there's 10 seconds left and then you know when you're at two minutes. Um, so we, we've got a third prepared question. Um, Consuelo, do you wanna take that one? Sure. If I can see it, <laughs> where is it? Oh, here it is. <clears throat> Hi, describe your approach to management of the criminal and civil section of the prosecutor's office, please, including attracting and retaining qualified and diverse staff. What do you believe that these sections are performing well? What do you believe that these sections are performing well? Okay. And what changes would you like to see in the future? Well, I am really, oh, thank you. I am really proud that I have built one of the most diverse um, personal leadership teams in all of King County, and that was by design. I am also working with our Equity Social Justice Committee to continue to diversify the PAO. And that means paying attention to how we advertise positions, who has a seat at the interview table, ensuring that all of our interview panels are watching and being aware of how to combat implicit bias, 
It means being very intentional about the types of values that we onboard and that we reward in terms of who becomes leaders within the office. Um, I'm also sending prosecutors to the National Black Prosecutors Conference every year to create a pipeline into the legal system. I also created a high school intern program where um, students who don't normally have access to a law firm have the ability to see that work inside. They're paid, they do the routine office work that every law firm has, and they also learn about our justice system. And I'm very proud that I have three former high school interns that now work for me as full-time um, employees within the office, and they are all individuals of color. Things that I want to do in the future, I want to continue to examine how we hold ourselves accountable internally. That means continuing to have all of our new employees go through mandatory implicit bias training, intro to cultural competency training. I've launched a women's leadership network within the office to really focus on the leadership challenges that women face that are unique to them. Um, and I want to continue to launch affinity groups so that all of our employees feel welcome and included. 10 seconds. Okay, I'm, I think I'm done. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, okay, we got one, one last uh, prepared question. Clayton, do you want to take this one, number four? Sure. There are over three dozen police agencies in King County. How will you use your position as the elected prosecutor to influence these agencies toward rebuilding trust with communities that have historically been harmed by their practices? Well, I, this is such an important question. So first and foremost, um, I have long thought it was a mistake for Dan Satterberg to not attend our monthly police chiefs and sheriffs meeting. And I share that openly with Dan. He always sent one of our deputy prosecuting attorneys. But I believe as the elected, you have to be in the room to build relationships and to be held accountable. And out of those relationships, you start to build trust. And I do think that some of our office's relationships with law enforcement have been fractured during the pandemic. So I would really like our prosecutors to start showing up at roll calls to train on our filing and disposition standards, to answer detective questions, to be single points of contact so that when law enforcement has a question in the field, they know how to reach out to, to us. And in rebuilding that relationship, it becomes a place to build out into the community. My community service is deep. I've long served on the boards of Pioneer Human Services, um, the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, which is addressing police shootings as part of gun violence. I've also served on the board of Pioneer Human Services, which is really about re-entering individuals from jail, prison, and substance use disorder back into our community. And I believe that once we repair relationships, we can all come to a place of common ground and build from there. And I'm committed to convening those individuals to play a role in helping us to continue to craft effective innovations in the realm of our criminal legal system. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, we are going to open it up now for any e-board questions. And again, um, if you have one minute to answer. Uh, Sarah, you have your hand up? I do. Um, what Under what circumstances do you believe that pretrial detention is necessary to ask the court to impose? And how would uh, the King County Prosecuting Attorney's policies and pr practices for requesting bail change under your leadership, if at all? You know, I, I really believe in our office's um, bail standards. I think they are quite reasonable. I think the challenge is that we have a court rule that may not serve public safety because it is geared toward release in non-capital cases. I would really like to convene a conversation with community, public defense, and judges to talk about whether we need to amend the rule so that there can be a more balanced approach. Also, those release decisions are often in our county made by pro tem judges. I think we're the only county in the state that offers that, that makes, that allows pro tem judges to make that decision. And I would ask Superior Court to consider assigning a judge to that 
decision-making um, body or to that role. Great, thank you. Uh, Clayton, you have your hand up for a question. Thank you. Um, Lisa, I'm, I'm, um, I'm curious how you would have handled the John T. Williams shooting um, that uh, is infamous in our region uh, for a good reason, I think. Uh, had you been in charge as the uh, King County prosecutor? When that, that case, when that case came into the office, I met with our concerned um, citizen um, groups, and we really struggled with that case because at the time, the standard was we had to prove malice, and malice had very strict guidance. It has to. It really meant like it was. An, uh, an approved plan to design to vex, annoy, and I can't remember what the third verb was. It's an almost impossible standard. And ultimately we decided that we could not meet that standard. And it was a tragic case and it was a tragic decision, but I also believe that it was the right decision in light of the standard at that time. And what you don't want is a prosecutor who files charges because it appeases the public. Sometimes you have to be willing to make the difficult decisions that disappoint our community because it is the standard of the law. And I wish we could have held that officer accountable, but I also believe that we made the decision that was correct under the law at that time. Since that time, I-940 has changed our standard and as many of you probably know, we have charged an officer with second degree murder for the, for the shooting death of an individual. Thank you. Um, we have time for maybe one or one more question, perhaps anybody else. I have one question if I may. Go ahead Consuelo, yeah. Or Clayton, do you have a question or? Um, I have a brief follow-up. Um, okay. But please. Okay. Um, my uh, my follow-up question is is uh, do you do you think that time itself can be an index of malice? Can be proof of malice? Because John T. Williams was shot four seconds after the policeman got out of his car. And, and that, that simple fact, uh, I think is the core of um, public understanding, at least my understanding of, of that situation. It's, it's something, it's something, it's a situation in which time itself seems to transcend all of the niceties of uh, reasoning of the legislature. You know, I wish that that were so, but that, that four second period of time establishes premeditation, but doesn't meet the legal definition of malice. Um, it establishes premeditation, which is a different standard. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I've, I've got one last question, unless anybody else does. Um, I'd love to hear your take, like how do you define restorative justice and how do you incorporate those principles into your work? I'm a big believer in restorative justice. Um, not every person who has suffered a harm wishes to see retribution. Often what they are really looking for is for the behavior to stop in a way of redress that really changes behavior and promotes understanding. Um, I was one of the individuals who brought restorative justice and peace, peacemaking circles to our practice in the juvenile um, justice realm. And I also had all of my leadership team go through a peacemaking circle training um, that lasted three days. Um, I'm a strong believer in it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, well, Lisa, we want to thank you for your time. Again, our, um, our endorsement meeting is on May 25th that you're welcome to attend if you wish. Um, Sarah, as chair, any other, any other last, uh, any other um, final thoughts before we let Lisa go? 
Yeah, she, uh, Lisa, you do have the opportunity to make a one minute closing. I'm oh, gonna... sorry, I forgot about the one minute closing, okay. yes. Well, maybe in lieu of the one minute closing, I don't think Consuelo had an opportunity to ask her question. So I'll defer to her and... Consuelo, do you want to... Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, I was very much struck with your attention um, when you were talking about staff and bringing in a more diverse staff. And I absolutely believe, I agree with you. I think that when you have police officers that look like the community that they're policing, there is much less likelihood of violence and, um, and acts of savagery to happen as we've seen with other police, unfortunately in other police departments. Um, have, have you, if you were elected, have you thought about how to partner with schools and with programs that certify police officers to actually to actively recruit in those communities? Um, and I would just like to hear your thoughts on that, on how we recruit. You know, one of my supporters is Sue Rohr, and I intentionally um, sought her out because I believe in her method of training um, police to be protectors, not warriors. Um, and I think that there are lots of great ways to connect with national organizations like the National Office of Black Law Enforcement Executives, for example, to create pipelines, to create mentorships, to help with the recruiting process. I also think that we can, for some individuals maybe, or some agencies that are having a hard time recruiting diverse candidates, maybe we should have a, re a retention fund that police agencies can tap in order to meet that goal. Okay, thank you. Um, would you like to give a one minute closing statement? You know, only as a brief follow up to the last question, I was intentional about not seeking endorsements from police guilds and here's why. I fought to get two, to get three FTEs, three um, bodies, to create a public integrity unit within the office to examine officer involved shooting and use of force cases after I-940. And if I'm endorsed by a bunch of police guilds, it hardly looks either fair or transparent. And so I just wanted to explain that I was very intentional about that. Okay, thank you so much for uh, giving us your time today and, and uh introducing yourself and answering these questions and um, we appreciate it. Anything else, eboard? anything else for Lisa before we let her go? No, thank you so much. I think we can turn off the record.